All good. Just roll. There we go. All right, sweet. Hey guys, welcome to um, Construct Strategically Yarns with Andy. Um, I'm here with Mark Parson today, who's a, a good friend, really good friend. And he's all about lean and Kaizen, about cutting waste. It's a Japanese process of cutting waste. But let's hear from Mark. And digitalization. Oh, sorry, mate. How about that? <laughs> and, let's and, cover that because that's where everything's going. That's it. 100%. 100%. Mm. Mate, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and what you do? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm currently the um, strategic program manager for digitalization at uh, New Zealand Post. Yep. And I've been doing this kind of stuff for, I don't know, about, about three or four years now. Yep. But most of my career is military. I was in the army full time for nine years and have been in, still in part time. Yeah, yeah. Um, teaching people how to plan operations. Yep. And uh, yeah, a lot of my career in between digitalization and the army was um, spent uh, with lean and continuous improvement teaching people how to do that for themselves so you can just grow all the grow all the success kill off all the waste and really optimize what you're doing and empower people interesting mm. can you can you can you talk us through a little bit of that process of how you go about but let's let's start with what's kaizen what's kaizen to you what's what's oh, it, what's what does cutting waste mean what what is the, it for the masses i mean it's plan do check act um, and yep. the cutting waste but there's there's seven or eight waste depending on which uh, Bit of thinking or model that you use, but yep. um, yeah, it's it's things like waiting, tra over transporting things, over processing things, and they're all all these wastes are hidden away everywhere through everything we do, um, everywhere in life, in your personal life, in your work life. Um, I personally, you know, find it it's really apparent when you go to a concert and yep. you're queuing to get in, and then you're queuing to get a drink, and then you're queuing to get something to eat, and as someone said it. The rugby the other night, I think it was in Wellington, they queued for something to eat and then there wasn't anything there. Right. So, um, yeah, all that waste it happens every day. And So the waste in that process is the time spent waiting without yep. a productive output. Or the over overproduction. So you're producing, let's say at the, at the rugby, we're producing lots of pies, but people actually just want to eat chips and they, they would have sold a lot more chips if they were aware that that's what people wanted. Um, okay, so let's stick with that example. What would Mark Parson do? Well, you want to get data, and that's probably what's led me into the digitalization space. You need to make your decisions based on facts, yep. fact-based decision-making. A lot of our decisions as leaders is based on my gut call. Emotion, mate. I've got the power. Testosterone, I'll choose. Testosterone, actually. Oh, maybe, you know, but women do it too. You know, oh, sorry, it's, it's... yeah, I, I don't want to be sexist. Can we, can we cut that bit out? <laughs> Guys aren't always bad leaders, but, um, yeah. you know, yeah, people often make decisions just probably lazily they yep. don't go and get the facts yeah um so yeah a lot of my work is actually getting really solid business cases that are stacked up so that you can't say no right and that helps people make fact-based decisions so so in a in a in, in a construction project let's yeah yeah this is um, that's where we met construction we did yeah yeah <laughs> can we talk a little bit about where we met yeah, yeah. oh yeah before so, then <laughs> before that so mark and i met at uh, fletcher construction um on on commercial bay no it was auckland airport yeah, I think we first were talking about Auckland Airport, yeah. There's actually a funnier story of how we met. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought you were getting to. <laughs> yeah, there is a funnier story of how we met. Do you want me to say that story? Or do you... Oh, well, we uh, we just ended up doing uh, antenatal class together. There we go. Really cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool bloke <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, thrown in the deep end of a topic we had no idea about. And, Absolutely. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the first, in, I think the first interaction that we had was, I think I asked the teacher, um, or the... <laughs> <laughs> what, not teacher, the, the class instructor for the antenatal class. Yeah, what? Like, what did I ask her? I asked her, um, um, oh. is, it, is it only going to be my wife, me, and the midwife in the room while we deliver the baby? And then you turned around and said, no, mate, we'll come for the appointment. <laughs> we'll come too. No, we'll we'll, we'll yeah, guide first, you through, mate. And then, and then I was sitting down there and going, what a <laughs> And no, uh, but, yeah, but then but, we had but then, a good laugh through that. Session, yeah, I know though, it was really cool, like, oh. really cool. And then, and then, then we became good friends after that. Yeah, then, then he came and visited me on Combe. And, and we found out we worked in the same company, which was exactly. kind of bizarre. So yeah, then we it was started working together. Yeah, yeah. Um, good, good times. <laughs> good times. And so we have children the same age, which is really cool. Yeah, as well. yeah. Now, I remember on that that job and every job that I worked with you. The thing that strikes me about you, mate, is. You know, you take this complex thing like Combe, right? Yeah. You've got so many trades. You've got a massive vertical building. You've got 
all these interacting components, people, processes, and flows. And you take all that down and you boil it into one diagram. Yeah. And someone like me, who's not normally a construction guy, I'm normally a process and digitalization sort of person, but I could look at it and go, oh, what's this? Yeah, and yeah. you're like, exactly, yep. that's a problem. And you yep. make it simple and visual for people. Yeah. Um, and that was just really powerful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you liked it. And yeah, mate, I'm, and I've always appreciated your support. Yeah. yeah, it's always there, mate. <laughs> but, no, no, you're the guy coming in and getting the getting the trades to actually engage. You know, that's something yeah, yeah. that I can't do. I can I can take an entire system and go right, process, location, who does what, where, when, and how much of it. Right? Okay, work all of that out. Need but, somebody to get. It's <laughs> need like somebody to implement. To that. go from the planner to yeah. get getting stuff done on the site, there's yep. it's like a different language. Yeah, hundred percent. Going from one person to the many, it's like speaking a different language, and you need someone to translate it. Yeah. And teaching, I really enjoyed that work when I was at Fletcher. It was hard. Yeah. Because you'd turn up and the site's there, and you, you know you're obviously not a tradie, although no. I can talk to anybody. Yeah. But you had to win them over and get them to plan ahead. They don't like planning ahead. They like to do it off the back of a fag packet. And then over a few weeks, they go from not planning ahead to actually taking your program milestones and back planning and syncing it all up together in a real simple way. And then if you had a good project leader leading that process, suddenly your plan, which is really smart and optimized, starts to happen on the ground. Okay. So it's pretty cool. Interesting, right? So I've worked on a few jobs where I can never get the last planner to work with yeah. a program. Yep. Instead of, yep. I've always found that challenging extremely difficult yeah. yeah so do you have ideas on how we can actually help implement last planner on a job where there's sharing of information and that master program data mm. flows into the last planner effectively and efficiently yeah 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 not not by manual post-it notes yeah right? yeah okay so how do we then enable that process to be efficient Last yeah. planner to master program. So there's there's two ways to make it happen. Yeah. One's hard and one is probably mostly unproven and not yet solved. Um, the hard one is you need good leaders. So like we had uh, Hannah Fletcher at, at, at Commercial Bay. Yep. She drove it. Should, should she worked out there every day. She engaged with people um, and, and the supervisors too did a good job in leading it. Um, if you don't have that leader, then we need to invest in leadership. And that's one of that long-term solution, which I really wanted to see out of construction. I don't work there anymore, but um, leadership development is something they need to invest heavily in because we've got a lot of people that I saw out there leading projects with almost no leadership skills. Right. Tolerating bad behavior, allowing things to lapse, not controlling things that need to be controlled and not giving freedom maybe where it needs to be given as well. You know, they just didn't have that skill set to manage all those complexities. So so to, investing in leadership is key for construction. They need to get onto that. And if you look at, I think someone said to me from, from a construction person said, you know, BCITO, they don't, they don't look after managers. They right. just look after trades. Well, right. Why is that? What's the most important job there? It's leadership to bring yeah. it all together. So they need to invest in leadership. So that's the long, hard path. How but, do we do that though? Well, we've got a, we've got a, make project management a professional requirement to take a job in it as a project manager. Qualification. And all of the companies need to come together and have a standard, set that standard and get people to start doing it before they, you know, as they come through uni. If you want to be an engineer, you've got to qualify as an engineer. If well, you want to be a whatever, yep. you've got to qualify as, a, as that trade. You don't have to qualify as the guy leading the job. But Where's the common sense in that? I know. <laughs> same, same goes to engineers to contracts. I don't know if you know much about them. You, yeah, in, I, in, I get the idea. Yeah, I kind of get what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in New Zealand, you don't need any qualification to be an engineer to the contract. It's, it's always blown my mind. It's, uh, yes, yeah, so exactly. I could, the same I could thing. turn around and go, hey, Mark Parson, my buddy, is going to be my engineer to the contract because I'm the client and I'd said so. But, and I know nothing about con you know, construction. Hey, yeah, you're my buddy, dude. Contract. <laughs> And that's called corruption. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's kind of state of play in New Zealand, though. It's to, tr truth, truth be told, anybody can be an engineer of the contract. Yeah, right. I mean, not, not, not for all projects, but I think NZTA have set of pre-qualifications. And as far as I know, NZTA are the only organization where it's controlled. Yeah, right, but, right. But I think the construction accords are talking about bringing a set of pre-qualified 
list of engineers to the contract, but I don't know. Anyway, yeah. so I was sorry, I was digressing there. No, 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 it's good. It's good. It's how good conversation. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the, the first second, thing you said is leadership. Yep. The second one, which is, I said it was kind of an unproven route, um, and that's digitalization of that that plan to execution and tracking process. Yeah. And there's um, I've looked at. I don't know, maybe 15 different companies and software around the world that's trying to track that that construction execution planning piece. Yep. But none of them really are as good as the post-it note process, albeit we all know that post-it notes on a wall is wasteful because you've got to walk over there to do it. But but yeah, I'd like to see someone solve that in a truly lean way. Um, I saw I saw a company called Sablono do it, and I, I started talking with them but um, I was out of the industry just at that same point in time. So, what out of that post-it note process, mm. what do you like out of that post-it note process that you cannot digitalize? Yeah, right. That's a great question. Mm. Um, because I work in digitalization, I love getting rid of paper, right? Me too. But I, I... there's some beautiful bits about that post-it note on the wall process. Um, simple visuals is the first one. Yeah. I, as a trade, as the electrician, I can see by floor or by um, room or by sector of a, of a horizontal, like a civil job, I can see where my pieces of the puzzle fit. I can then look at that same board and look at what colors um, coming before me because I have to go after them and I need to basically make sure they're done so I can do my bit. So I know who to talk to because they're the same people every time. That's If it's blue, then I go and talk to the person who looks after the blue stuff. Very simple. The other thing, the most beautiful thing about it is when they put their task with their duration on that board in that zone on that day, they are committing to doing that work. Where do you get that anywhere else? You know, they're actually, I'm going to do this on this day. I understand the power of that. Yeah. But I have a few problems with that process. Yep. Yep. There are. It's not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I mean, as a planner. Um, with the last planner process, I've, I've I've always wanted the last planner to work. I've I've always been looking for last planners to make this process. Yeah, work. yeah, absolutely. I, I understand the power in the process, right? But the problem I have with it is it'll never tell you what total float or the amount of available float you've got at the end of every single task. For for simplistic purposes, how much longer can I delay that piece of paper before yeah. it starts impacting the overall timeline of my project? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's that's one big thing. Yeah. Yep. The second big thing I've got is not one of these posted boards have I ever seen this is a critical task on the master program highlighted. So which means ah, that's an okay. unmovable task yep. that has to be achieved on a particular day. So we solved the second one already. We, we were doing that. Yep. Um, I can't remember. It wasn't me who came up with that idea. It was, was one of the other guys in the team, um, either Kevin or Pete or maybe even one of our customers our internal project managers and leaders but all they did was they they said we'll make this task so important yep. and often it was like a uh, inspection from the customer or from the from the council or something we'll make that a milestone so we treat it like a milestone that can't move because the milestones aren't allowed to move and you know you work in the last planner in the last planner so that's what people do and then they would schedule no other tasks for that at that point or that point on like you might sequence them but but you could clearly see there was a gap at that point and that that had to happen, otherwise the rest of it doesn't happen. So that that's that one. Um, going back to your other question around um, the float, you know, Total float. You're, you're managing things every day, things shift. How do you know what the float is? So the key thing that we were pushing and it was a real discipline that people didn't have that we were trying to help them with was having a um, quantities on those tasks. Because if you've got quantities on those Measurable. tasks, every day you know if it's 50 meters of you know gap 65 I have to put down in this trench, you can measure that. And if you can measure it over three days, because what used to happen is they go, oh, for three weeks I'm putting in gap 65 over there. Awesome. And they go, are you on track? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, I'm not going to meet that. Yeah. So with the... But, but then what's the impact of not meeting it? That's, that's what I'm getting to. Oh, what's yeah. The well, impact? Well, you know what the impact is. I, I know, because I'm but the my point, I'm the my point is we were getting them to put, okay, today it's 50 meters, 50 meters, 50 meters, rain, zero meters. Sure. Um, we've got a new machine coming then, 75 meters, 75 meters. So you can measure if they're doing the 50 meters. And if they're not, over three days, you start to get a projection of where they're going to fall. And yep. you can then make a data-informed decision to change your method of operation to Absolutely. meet the so, timeline. There we go, right? There we go. So... How does that information 
get to me. Uh, and that's or the get problem. Or to, get to the planner. That's exactly what I'm getting at, right? Yeah. So there's the massive <clears throat> disconnect, I think. So you're capturing great information, yeah? yeah? How do you transfer that information and make it yeah. Yeah. a lot more useful than it is? Structured data that's more a lot more useful. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think we're going to solve it here today. No, but. no, no. But we. So, so when I first got to Fletcher, I, I, I learned a lot from a guy called Callum McCorkadale, who was, yeah. um, you know, he's working on uh, Waterview Tunnel. Funny, mate. You're the, you're the, you're the second person in he's my podcast. He's a very podcast, talented guy. Second person on my podcast to talk about Callum. Yep, very talented guy and very willing to share. Yeah. Very good leader. He was all about enabling people to do this lean stuff because he didn't believe it. Yeah. He was one of those people who go. That doesn't sound like that's going to work, but I'm, I want to prove it wrong or I want to go and have a look. So yeah, anyway, so Callum led, led it with Lean on um, lean construction on, on Waterview. Waterview himself uh, with a bit of help from the uh, lean, oh, what were they, lean Construction Institute? Anyway, they helped him. He, de- he led it really, really well, generated heaps of benefits, delivered, uh, what was it, three months early, his yep. section. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, so that, to answer your question back to then, his view, and he's, you know, he makes a good point, you need to spend the money on an administrator who's capturing that stuff and documenting it so that it can be used by the by, whoever needs the data. By the costing team, by the planning yeah. team, by, by, I don't know. By the now, QSs. no one wants to hire people to run around documenting stuff like that, but that was a big job. He managed to get it done. Yeah. Um, I think she, that person was a student as well, so it's sort of, they got a win-win out of it. There must be smarter ways to do it, mate. Right? Oh, well, yeah, if you do it digitally and it says 50 metres on your app for that task and you have to put in how many metres you did in order to sign that task off for the day, then you'll be capturing that data digitally. It will just flow through and, you know. I just I just don't think we're there yet. <laughs> no, we're not. And that not was one of the things I saw. We never implemented a digital solution, A, because... The, there wasn't really a great example out there, but B, we found people weren't, weren't overly savvy with technology. Yep. Again, human skills and training. How do we get our industry up to this up to speed? With yep. They use phones every day to go to the pub. Why aren't we? We use, we use Google every day to map our way home, mate. <laughs> in, in Auckland, you've got to navigate by Google because yeah. it'll take you a different way, right, to get yeah, home bus. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm confident there's, there's a smarter, faster, better way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't think we're even close to identifying what an integrated way of working is. I don't know, would you agree? Yeah, no, we're, we're I long feel like it's just there, but is yeah. Is this there, you reckon? Some, you know, you've got smart people building these cool apps, but they're just like, they track all the data. It's easy to see all my tasks, but I can't see the wall. I yeah. can't see that. Okay. So yeah, Here's we're the almost got, there, right? but we're not. You've got, you got smart people building a lot of smart solutions. Nothing's integrated though. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. so. Well, I don't, the I, back I don't end wanna... data is, but I can't as a trade visualize the other trades I have to interact with or the the, the, the model, you know, yeah, the model. Yeah, 3D model. Yeah. If everyone's walking around with Google Glass integrated plan to their phone to checklist, you know, yeah. project controls, then yeah, we're right. gonna have that, that holistic visibility of everything that's interacting and how and where and when. Inevitably, that's got to be the future. Yeah. You know, Some, you've, 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 got, you've got to start from a 3D model, build a program out of it, have a set of common common data environment. Like I think I made, I came up with this word in my last podcast. I just, I just, I just called it a project data structure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay? Yeah, like yeah. a standardization for every project. That's the first thing you'll ever do. Yeah. These are the zones. These are the sub-zones. And that's what we always started with in the paper model was yeah. what are the zones? Yeah. We had to coach people on how to, how to lay the zones out. What's, what part of the process is it? You know, you've mm. got to now code all of that because think about it. You don't need multiple pieces of data to code, right? You need, you need location data. You need process Categories. data. Yeah, yeah. You, need, you, need, you need bits and pieces of process data and you need people data. Who, mm. who's, who's doing what where? Right? Yeah. Just go back to age-old basics, right? It's pretty simple. Absolute way. fundamentals and that's all it is. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, mate. Anyways, interesting. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about your army life, man. Oh, right. <laughs> Can't talk about that. No. Oh, shit. Confidential. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. Um, how, how did that transition happen for you from, you know, I mean, what were you doing in the army? How did that transition happen for you into <laughs> construction? And, and, and now you're working client side? So looks like you've had a really interesting journey all along. Yeah, you know, yeah. Army, yeah. hardcore construction transition into 
um, client side project management or digitalization? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I guess <laughs> there's, there's lots of elements to that, but um, I think going from the army, uh, you, you often, a lot of people get to the point where they want to try something new, let's say, or uh, want to try a new environment or, you know, I, I ended up going overseas because I, to be honest, I wanted to go into a conflict and uh you know <laughs> Why? We're, we're crazy people like that um because you want to test yourself it's just like a ballerina mm. wanting to go on stage in front of the the biggest theater in the, in the world kind of thing you, yeah. you want to get out there and do your stuff in the place that that it most challenges you to to see if you can do it yeah so that's what i wanted to go and do um yeah because yeah, we'd done peacekeeping and i i didn't rate that very highly so i left the army went over and and Ended up doing project work, running uh, election security in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. And then I um, ended up being a commercial guy trying to lift the company. Well, I did lift the company from uh, a loss maker in Sudan to a, a you know an ongoing um, money maker. Wow. Did a lot of jobs throughout the Middle East and in, in the commercial security space, uh, advising people on security um, using my army knowledge. And then I wanted to come home again, and so I sort of had to start from scratch. So I went back, went to uni, being interested in business. Did you? Yeah, went, went and did my master's in business, and then, um, yeah, started working my way, I guess, up the corporate ladder, but horizontally, going from company to company, depending on what sort of job, you know, because you always get paid more when you jump to the next company, is you what I've do. learned, yeah. which is the, crazy. It's the, another it's the only way to give yourself thing. a pay rise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it definitely worked well for me, and I've gone had some fantastic roles, just looking to see where I can uh, add some value and what interests me. And yeah, so, my role- So where did that transition really into lean come from? Where did that passion for lean come from? Oh yeah, go? so when I went back, I went back to Defence after uni and they put me on a lean course. Right. Uh, with, with a good friend of mine now, um, Tim, who lives over in Georgia. And he was from Lockheed Martin and that's one of the oh. Fortune 500 companies, right? LMT. Oh. LMT. I, I, own some, I own some shares. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have in the past. Um, yeah, and, and it just seemed to me to be gold. I mean, you can't, you look at Toyota, man. When I was a kid, Toyotas were, you know, you didn't want to own a Toyota. That yeah, was, that was cool. entry level. That's yeah, not cool. Yeah. And then come the 90s, number one in the world for car manufacturing. How did they do that? You know, so learning from the way that they treat their people, you know, uh, they empower them and they challenge them and they give them time to improve every little thing everywhere. Uh, and it, it's just such a slick machine, but it's never good enough. They're always looking for the next improvement, and and yeah. So I just thought that was the way ahead for for anything in life. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. yeah. Then took that on as a. I also got a buzz once you've done a few improvement projects with people. Yeah. Like I did this one with I was with Vero Insurance, and they were staff burning out way too many files. You go and sit with them, you know, go to the Gemba, go to the source, and watch what's going on. The guy's got a whole heap of files open. You know, there's no way he can process that work. While he's got files, he's trying to figure out as an like insurance claim, someone's on the phone with the next one, opens the next, and it just kept coming for this guy. And I just thought, oh, this is terrible. We've, we've got to... So we worked out a way to, um, yeah, have a set file limit, you know, standard work. This is how many files a person can cope with. We put them on um, files, you know, clearing, doing investigations work and phone calls so that they only did one task at a time. Right, and that allowed them to clear out their work much faster because they weren't getting interrupted every five minutes. We also they had a bunch of calls that they um, were getting that weren't needed for them; they were for other people. So we sorted right. out that phone routing automated system so that it worked better. And then, yeah, I just so getting back to my point, I come in one day and I said, "Oh, hey, uh, how's it going?" He goes, "Oh, hey, Mark, when are we doing some more lean stuff?" When I first met him, I walked in there; he was ashen faced on a Monday morning you know, already stressed at the start of the day at how shit his day was going to be. I come in there, he spins around in his swivel chair, big smile on his face. Come and look at this. I've got five files open. I said, oh, so you can cope with that. And yep, I can get that done. You know, I'm not on calls till here. When are we doing the next lean thing? Interesting. So you, you I went just couldn't there. work after that. I was so, yeah. the, the, just, you know, you're giving so much to that person who hated their life every Monday to Friday and then... He's happy now. That must be know? an empowering feeling. So, so good for everybody. Yeah. Everybody wins. So, so yeah, I got a buzz out of that and I love doing it. You went in there, you understood their process and you refined the well, process. Well, I learned from them. Learned their process <laughs> and completely refined their process. Yeah. Yeah. And percentage of efficiency. 
I can't remember, but yeah, there was... Rough estimate. Yeah, I have terrible memory, Andy. You know this. <laughs> Too much rum, probably. <laughs> Too much um, rum. But um, in, in that business, oh, I think we saved 18,000 hours, people hours that year of wow. time across That's all huge. the projects. And, and that one was one of the biggest, yeah. 18,000 man 18,000. 18,000. Yeah. So there's a lot of time saved that otherwise would have been wasted doing stuff that didn't add value and stress people out and the customers got angry about. So yeah, pretty awesome. It's a huge saving, man. Yeah, yeah. No, good on you. Oh, well done. And it, we just, yeah. just got to find ways to bring that into construction as I, well. I just feel New Zealand's behind the eight ball, man. Cause, oh, yeah. You know, overseas, this stuff is pretty standard with a lot of different industries. Yep. Interestingly, Ministry of Social Development does it really well. IRD does it very well. Yeah. It's been mandated that they do this kind of continuous improvement. I haven't worked in there, but I've, I've certainly talked to people. And when they talk through their improvements, you go, you know what you're doing? You're... you're you're obviously nailing some good stuff there. So, and you can see it, right? Like if you go and do IRD stuff online now, it's, it's quite a simple. slick process, man. Yeah, it used yeah. to be terrible. Yeah. It's much better. Man. So yeah, it, if everyone was doing this kind of thinking, everyone's lives would be a hell of a lot better. Just just cutting waste out. Yeah. Just focus on cutting waste out. For me, yeah, in, in my world, that translates to what's my critical path. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Uh, literally what it translates to. Otherwise me. you'll end up with waiting. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even when I'm making a coffee, I'm thinking, like, oh, it's pretty bad. But there's some bits underneath that, like one of the sites at Fletcher, they um, they thought, oh, it's, we can save transport costs by getting all our steel in early. Right. So they got all the steel in and they chucked up the site. Sure enough, some logistics, you, logistics you actually killed your flow. Yeah. And flow is number one, right? Well, yeah, flow of, of five different things is, is number one. So they killed, killed their flow on the site. Yeah, and yeah. suddenly you're you're compounding waste all over the show. Yeah, you know. Anyway, overproduction. We've got a little bit of time left, so in that in, in that little bit of time, what I what I wanted to talk to you about was um I know I know you run um um these sessions called the War Games. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Are we are we allowed to talk about it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So um, war gaming is another thing you could do anywhere. I know, right? I know. I've, I've I've always found that interesting. Can you can you tell our audience and me um what what war game is all about and how it could um help leadership skills because because we did yeah. talk a little bit earlier about new zealand lacking leaders and could that possibly be a way absolutely to help leaders <clears throat> grow in the industry to make data-driven smarter faster decisions um yeah will it make data-driven faster decisions what it would do is um prevent problems um, cool. so right. so war gaming is or red teaming as it's called elsewhere is often used to solve problems before they happen and, and all you're doing is running a simulation so um yeah you take Talk us through a process of how a war game would would normally run yeah so i mean you host them. yeah we we basically run military ones so we're tackling military problems and we we lay out the the environment and the players and we give them um constraints or, or um, attributes and then um, we basically have a set of rules and we each there's two sides and you compete to win and which is good because can you give me an example oh so the the war game we run recently um two big ones was refighting the falklands campaign yeah which is fascinating because the brits won but in real life uh sorry if 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 you ran that scenario with with the same kind of level of skill on each side there's no way the brits would have won right so they got very lucky in a number of areas okay. and they were more they were better trained and more skilled at, at their decision making and their craft and that's why they won so so you have a team two teams of people yeah they're given a scenario and a set of constraints yeah and a set of goals and a set of goals and yep. then they they make they compose their groupings and their their plan of attack to yep. conduct the activity secure the goals yeah or and the goals might be defeat different parts of the other side yeah and then you just run it through in cycles action counteraction reaction and you just keep rolling through like that there's a bit of dice throw because there's always chance and everything like 100%. a construction site yep. warfare same thing it rains it doesn't rain the soil's hard it's not yep. um so yeah well, you roll the dice a bit and you've got apply the rules and then you have outcomes and you just keep cycling like that and so what you see is people have to make decisions based on assumptions or facts and then there's outcomes from those decisions and there's also debate between leaders yeah and so helping teams to actually how do we debate things in a constructive way right versus just get 
versus this conflict. switches off and the and this switches on and we just yeah. have a go at each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, how do we listen, check our understanding, and debate the points, make a call and carry on. That all sounds like good qualities good leadership any stuff. leader should have. So you guys have it. If you uh, ever want to run um, construction, sorry, war games. <laughs> I keep saying construction, I don't know why. War games, um, give them... Um, Hit, hit mark up and mate i i need to come along for one of those sessions next yeah time. yeah I, I, I'm, heavy on. I know i know yeah. you uh, you sent me an invite for the last one i couldn't make it but i'm really keen to get on yeah that'd be I'm, good i'm always looking for continuous improvement as well but um hey mate i think we've kind of run out of time but um i really want fun it's been a lot of fun man <laughs> we actually covered quite a few things and, yeah and that was awesome um yeah. is there is there anything else you want to kind of say to close things off um no, no. I, yeah, pleased to be here and love what you do and keep doing it, mate. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate it, mate. Really Cheers. good shirt. Thanks, mate. Ho hopefully we'll have one. Be here soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, always, <laughs> mate. Always. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody.